So once we are live, I'll introduce server and then we can start. Yeah, we are live now. Okay. So, uh, so it's eight o'clock and good morning, uh, everyone. Hope you all are going, doing good and uh, this is a, a busy vacation. So you must be very busy in your practice and your fellowship training. So today uh, we are going to discuss the most common pediatric orthopedic fracture, which is supracondylar humerus fracture. And as a fellow, uh, you all should be aware of all the tips and tricks of uh, dealing with a supracondylar humerus fracture. Uh, so today we have Dr. Sarwar uh, Ibn Salem, who is professor of pediatric orthopedics at Bangladesh. He's a very good friend of mine. And uh, we share uh, our parent fellowship institution also. So Sarwar uh, uh, will take us through the basics of supracondylar humerus fracture management. And in subsequent week, we will have uh, uh, the the uh, atypical supracondylar situations. So one thing uh, uh, we should uh, let me do. Can we do uh, mute the participants on entry? Uh, Neeraj, if we can do that, and. Uh, Dr. Chinmay Sangoli from um, uh, Amravati and Dr. Srinam Bansal from uh, Orthokis. They will moderate the session. We have a couple of interesting cases uh, after the question answers. So, server, welcome. And thanks for uh, uh, contributing your time for teaching of fellows. So, uh, you can share your screen and you can start uh, teaching and the people would join eventually. Server. Can you uh, see my? No, it's something uh, post attendee Zoom. Uh, we, we cannot see your screen. I mean, we can see your screen, but there's no presentation. Stop and reshare it. Yes. Yes, yes. Now we can see. Hi, Shyam, how are you? So, is that okay now? Morning? Yes, we, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. So, we are 14 participants here, and I understand most yeah, of they... us are, uh, most, most of them are uh, residents, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, so they are so, fellows and residents. So fellows yeah. and residents. Very good morning to everyone. Uh, there, uh, I can see some, someone is from Bangladesh also. Good morning, everyone. I have a small story to tell you before I go with this academics. Story is in uh, I work in Mitor. Mitor is National Institute of Traumatology and Orthopedic Rehabilitation. I'm just back here after almost 14 years. So 14, 15 years back when I was uh, uh, I was working here, I uh, I would see I would see some 15, 20 percent of my patients are pediatric patients in my emergency, in my outdoors, in whatever, in, in the wards. But we didn't have a pediatric orthopedic department or a subject developed in Bangladesh, even at that time. It was 2005, 6, 7, and 10, So uh, that, is, that was a 500 bed only orthopedic and trauma hospital. Now it is 1,000 bed. So I thought I should learn uh, pediatric orthopedics. I had a neck for pediatrics. If I wouldn't be a orthopedic surgeon, I would be a pediatrician. So I searched for one of my friends told me that there is a big pediatric orthopedic surgeon in India and gave me his email. And it was Ashok Johari at hotmail.com. I still remember uh, the email address. 
I got that in 2006. So I mailed him the answer and I went there in 2008, where a uh, few years back, Molin was also there, isn't it, Molin? I was there in 2006, six. five and six, yeah. So that was how I started uh, my pediatric orthopedic career. And what I'm telling this story, after going to Mumbai and staying in India for one year, I had some friends. Uh, of course, Molin is one of them. Karol Nagda, Sandeep Padbardhan, Alari Karujis, Rujuta Mehta, all those. And these friends, all, and there are many other names. These all friends, uh, they were helping me a lot, learn pediatric orthopedics in different conferences we, we have met. And these people helped develop pediatric orthopedics in Bangladesh. So my respect and thanks to all these Indian pediatric pedipods, they were actually, I call them the friend of pediatric orthopedics in Bangladesh. So sorry, I uh, shared some of my personal stories here, but I had to. Thank you, Molin. Thank you, yeah. Orthopedics, for uh, asking me to present today. So we are uh, we are talking about supracondylar fracture in children. It doesn't uh, or, or really happens in uh, adults. And we'll be doing the... Can you see? Yeah, you have to... I reach share your screen i think oh sorry post disabled participants screen sharing the post has to uh, uh, enable me okay shinam you you can enable to share the screen okay Unfor unfortunately uh, i have to leave so i'm not the host today Otherwise, this would not happen. Okay, Shinam. Yes, sir. you can now uh, try to share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. So. Sir, we can see now. Yeah, but I don't know why, but it's not going down. What happens? If it is not, uh, I'll stop share and redo it. Uh, uh, yes, reopen the file you want. Uh, you want to share? Yeah, I did. Sir, click the slideshow tab. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hold on. This is not going to work. Uh, uh, yes, start it. Okay. So there we go. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, it's one of the commonest fracture in children, and of course, the commonest elbow fracture. And between the three and seven years, it is most common. And as like all other pediatric fractures, more common in boys because they are physically active, a little more active than the girls. And almost these are all closed injuries, very rarely it, it's, uh, these are open. There could be neurovascular compromise in quite a good number of cases. So elbow pain, tenderness, swelling, decreased range of motion, all of these you'd find in a post-traumatic elbow injury, I mean, uh, in a supracondylar fracture patient. And if there is anticubital ecchymosis, puckering of skin, and there is too much of swelling, that should alarm us. We should do detailed neurological examination. Uh, nerve injury is not that common. The median nerve is more affected. Vascular injury is pretty common. I, I said about 10% cases there could be neurovascular injuries and that has to be done. We have to see the, of course, the radial pulse, the worm, capillary refill, all these things we have to see in a patient with elbow trauma 
pain and swelling. So standard AP and lateral view of uh, elbow is uh, advised, but we should do the forearm also if there is anything else distally or in the mid-sharp, whatever. And Bauman angle and anterior humeral line in AP and lateral nadiograph is uh, two important things to see. We'll, we'll, we'll see about those things a little later. So in a summary, it is one of the commonest pediatric fracture and commonest elbow fracture in children. And in X-ray, we should see anterior humeral line and Bowman's angle. Sometimes fat fat sign helps us diagnosing in a, such a case. Gut vein classification, which is uh, standard, we'll see it today again. And close reduction and percutaneous spinning is the standard operative treatment when surgery is indicated. Not all the cases we need to go for surgery. And if we do not manage uh, supracondylar fracture humerus properly, may, it may end up with deformity. So let's come with anterior humeral line. The, if we draw a line along the anterior part of the humeral shaft, uh, we know all that the capitellum is below the humeral line. I mean humerus, the lower end of humerus. In lateral view, it should cut the middle or middle third of the capitellum. As you see on the left, the first uh, film on the left side. And if does not, after a elbow injury, if doesn't cross the middle or middle third, like the second or the third pic uh, picture, we should have a suspicion that there is, there could be a supracondylar humerus fracture. That, that, that picture, uh, in the third picture, you can see the fracture line quite clearly, but in uh, the second picture, it's not clear. But still with this anterior humeral line, we should have a suspicion that there is a fracture. So anterior humeral line is uh, so much so important in supracondylar fracture in lateral view XA, and so is Bowman's angle in AP view, anterior posterior view. Bowman's angle, I, I, I understand all of you know, this is a longitudinal mid uh, humeral shaft line, and uh, the angle between this and the capitular uh, line, which is about 64 to 81 degrees in uh, different population. And this Bowman angles, you can see in the second picture, it's about 80 degrees of uh, Bowman's angle, which is 100 degree after a supracondylar fracture. So this two would help us uh, diagnosing uh, uh, fracture if the fracture line is not clear or the reduction is not good. Fat pet sign is sometimes important. In, there are fractures uh, which are not seen in uh, cannot be seen in X-ray or an occult fracture. Uh, there could be elbow swelling, and we can see some uh, this anterior posterior pad pad sign, and that should alert us that there is occult fracture. We, we are not seeing it in X-ray. So the standard classification Gartland uh, showed this way: the type one, there is no displacement; type two, there is the posterior. Uh, Hinge is still intact, not separated, and type three is totally separated. So there is some modification like type one, two, three, we have just said. Type four is a fracture when that is unstable in flexion and extension, and there is lack of intact periosteum. And uh, one occult uh, fracture is said that suspected fracture, there was a trauma, tenderness, and radi radiographic elbow effusion shows. Bad, bad sign that we have already shown. So there are some emergency situations uh, we should uh, keep in mind as, a, as a working in the uh, emergency room of any hospital. If after an uh, elbow trauma, there is absence of radial pulse, the hand is shaming, fail, fail or pull, there is severe swelling in the forearm uh, or elbow, that if there is skin puckering or anterior bruising of the elbow, 
if there is an open injury and neurological injury. So these things should alert uh, a resident in the emergency or anyone in the emergency. And that patient will need emergency orthopedic care. So there is a treatment algorithm uh, of the uh, gut, gut length classification. We can use it. Uh, there are some changes, of course. Type 1, we can do a long arm cast or spray. And elbow should be at 90 degree of flexion or a little less. You have to see the pulse. And uh, a plaster of such plaster three to four weeks is enough. Type 2, there is uh, differing opinions. Some prefer long arm cast and follow up for the rest of the time. The patient may end up with a little uh, flexion contracture for a, a few days and then it comes okay. And some advocates close direction and percutaneous spinning. Because when uh, a type 2 fracture, you go for reduction. Uh, before that, it was quite stable, but after reduction, it it may become unstable. So if we go for close reduction of any type two fracture, we should be ready for any percutaneous feeding, feeding if it is needed. Again, Bowman angle and humeral line will help us seeing type two fracture in post reduction state. Type three, all we know and we mainly, the orthopedic surgeons, commonly treat uh, this close reduction and uh, with close reduction and percutaneous pain because the fracture was totally separated, the proximal and, and distal part. And as I said earlier, that if there is any vascular compromise or any compartment syndrome, we should have, we should be careful enough. Immobilization is approximately three to four weeks, depending upon whether it is a young children or a little older. And postoperatively, should we go for physiotherapy or not? Is uh, a little controversial. Some surgeons do not uh, like to give any physiotherapist, at least any passive physiotherapy. I also do not go for any passive physiotherapy because these are children with time, they will all yeah. acquire uh, good reduced uh, yeah. in, a, in a good reduced supracondylar fracture they will acquire full range of movement so server through this platform you know you must we must tell them that there is no need of physiotherapist involvement in supracondylar fractures we no. have to teach the patient that how to do active therapy even parents should not force because this can lead to myositis and all those problems so do not involve therapist, uh, no massage. We always tell there is no, no massage is needed because it all can create problems. So through your platform, no therapy. So I agree with you. I also never advise a physiotherapy. Thank you, Molin. This is one of the most important uh, thing after reduction or after the treatment. So... I am telling about the standard or the basics of pediatric, uh, I mean, the supracondylar fracture. So I'll, I'll go with no complications and the usual things. So the supracondylar fractures would be uh, uh, are flexion type and extension type. In 95 to 98% cases, these are extension types. The child uh, falls in outstretched hand and the uh, elbow is extended and so the fracture, the distal fracture fragment goes in extension. So all we see is usually this extension type very rarely 2 to 5 percent could be flexion type. So the rules of uh, the uh, close reduction, the uh, surgeon and the assistant should take the patient under anesthesia and under CM in an in an OT and the traction should be given in 10 degree of at least 10 degree of flexion. <coughs> the traction is applied for five minutes at least five to ten minutes. Then under the CM we can go for reduce. In some cases it may not reduce. 
why uh, it may not reduce there could be brachialis muscle entrapment and we have to milk it out milking of the brachial uh, it is called milking maneuver of the biceps and the brachialis from the mid and we, we should start it from the mid arm and distally and we might have to do it for repeated times and then uh, the muscle may come out of the fracture fragments so this milking maneuver we should know uh, very rarely this happens so this uh, it, this interferes with uh, the reduction and keeping the traction we should now correct if there is any translation or in angulation that should be corrected rotation angulation these things should be corrected now now we should take the cm in lateral uh, view and do with the extension management maintaining the correction of elbow and we should push the olecranon with the thumb the surgeon should uh, do that and still we have to keep the hand in uh, forearm in supination and we will try to reduce if it is reduced uh, if the flexion is more than 120 degree it is taken that the fragments are reduced if it is not it could be it could be uh, in extension steel and we might to repeat the total procedure so once it is reduced usually we keep the forearm in tonation this helps in two things one is very commonly uh, there is varus of the fragment so this varus is correction with this formation and it stabilizes the fracture so when we go for this percutaneous pinning uh, it is better to keep the forearm in this full flexion and pronation it will help in stabilization of the fracture and if there is any varus angulation correction of that varus angulation so in lateral view whether it is okay or not this our gigas appearance the of the distal humerus distal humerus in lateral view will tell us that it is in good reduction only this restoration of our gigas appearance of the olecranon fossa is seen good in lateral view and it indicates that it is in correct alignment so this we can see that we should we should have a practice to see this hourglass appearance in the lateral view so as i said that 2 to 5 percent cases are flexion type so we, we have to know about the flexion type also and the posterior peristome is usually ruptured and the maneuver is uh, one of hyper extension and once it is reduced it is best to stabilize with the uh, it is best to stabilize the factor with kvr because if we do not stabilize this fracture with uh, kvs uh, in uh, inflection type it, we we might have to keep the forearm in uh, hyper extension and that is uncomfortable for the patient and there could be swelling and all those things so <clears throat> one more thing we have to remember that capitulum is not in line with the humerus it is in 25 to 30 degree of anterior angulation so in a reduced supracondylar fracture, the capitulum should be like this, around 25 to 30 degree of anterior angulation, with the humeral line, mid lateral mid humeral line. So anything less or more than, more than that may uh, may not be well reduced. This is an uh, interesting uh, paper by Uni Narayanan. Uni Narayanan uh, is a Canadian, I think Indian born Canadian uh, orthopedic, a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. And he won the best trauma paper in POSNA 2017 post annual meeting. And he showed that up to a displacement of 30% medial or 15% lateral in AP plane, this is very important for all of us who, who, who do this supracondylar factors that 30% of medial or 15% of lateral in the AP plane and 33% anterior and 37% posterior in the surgical plane 
Bowman's angle between 59 to 83 degrees, I just said that 64 to 81 is normal in different races and ages, but uh, Bowman has, uh, Bowman's angle between 59 and 83, he said. And if the anterior humeral line that does not cross anterior to the capitella, it crosses anywhere in the capitella. So all these things are completely comfortable with an excellent uh, outcome based on physical appearance, carrying angle and all those things. So these things should we, we can keep in mind that we do not have to go for absolute reduction, but this, this would be enough. These things would be enough for a very good result. So about pinning now, we have done the reduction. Pinning previously, it was cross pinning, but nowadays the standard pinning is lateral pinning. You can, you can uh, uh, two, give two parallel or two divergent or three uh, uh, lateral pin. Most important one is if you send one pin crossing the four cortices, it is possible. Uh, you enter from the lateral epicondyle then go across the uh, lateral cortex of the polycranial fossa, then the medial fossa, and then the medial uh, layer of the humerus. So if you can cross these four cortices, it will be a very stable one. So it depends upon the surgeon or the stability, you can send two or three pins. Sometimes, uh, even with three pins, it may not be enough uh, stable. So we might have to go for medial pinning because there is medial uh, combination uh, in many of the times. And medial during medial pinning, we should have to keep in mind about the ulna nerve. In flexion, the ulna nerve is more taut, and we all know it has gone just behind the medial pin, uh, medial recondite. So. The lateral pinning we can do close, but if medial pinning, it is better to open the medial epicondyle a little for a medial pin. With experience, you may not need that, but better keep in mind that for a medial pinning, we should have a small opening in the medial epicondyle. So sometimes uh, patients come with this type of tuberous virus. It was not well managed. The patient should have been uh, given part of pins and ends up like this. And you might have to go for this reaction. So our take home message, I've just uh, completed my lecture. Our uh, take home message uh, would be, we have to identify, identify the fracture, whether it is flexion or extension type, and very importantly, we have to check the neurovascular deficit. If we, uh, though it is only around 10% of cases where we, we might have uh, neurovascular cases, but those, those could be uh, dangerous for the patient if you do not manage at, in right time and right way. So in, uh, to ensure a good stability, we should have a good pin spread. Uh, divergent pins are better than parallel pins. If we need, we should give three pins. Standard two or three lateral pins are enough. Medial pins are very rarely needed. And if we have to give one medial pin, it has to be safe enough. So thank you very much. Thank you very much from Hatirjil. Hatirjil is where I live. It is the front of my home. Thank you, everyone. So I thanks. Yeah, thanks, Sarva. This is a lovely presentation. And uh, one more thing is like um, we all tend to check the external, the lateral reduction in external rotation view. Once we fix it, we should uh, do an internal rotation view because that is the position in which the child will be immobilized. Right. If in internal rotation you see there is rotational malalignment, one can add a, a, another pin, a medial pin to make it a stable. So that's what is missing. And I tend to keep uh, the forearm after maneuver in supination and then see medial and lateral border. If laterally it is opening, then I would pronate the forearm. Uh, 
but in many a times it's stable in supination and then i i go uh, for the ulnar pinning how how you manage uh, the medial pinning how you manage to prevent ulnar now can you come again uh, and that will help the fellows Okay. Uh, as I said, very rarely now nowadays it is standard is lateral pinning two or two whatever. But sometimes we need to give medial pinning, and yes. it is better to make a small opening in the medial epicondyle. We know that the ulnar nerve is gone behind the uh, medial epicondyle. So if we open and keep a little anterior and uh, keep a artery or something like that pushing the posterior uh, part of the incision then the ulnar nerve will not be harmed when i uh, mm. put the uh, or when i do the drilling mm -hmm. and otherwise it is possible that the ulnar nerve will be uh, injured right so small opening and put a posterior guard before uh, drilling the cava right there are a few questions. Chinma, you can uh, moderate the session. Yes, sir. So, we have one question, sir. Uh, should we give post op slab in pronation by Dr. Chinma? Well, that is not essential. If we, if we have a uh, good stability, we do not, uh, we can give it a normal posterior uh, splint. I mean, in uh, supination, not, we do not need to do it in pronation. I'll Okay, sir. And there is one more question that uh, what's approach for the late presenters, say type 3, after 3 to 4 weeks of injury? In most of the cases, in, in this late presenting cases, say after 7, 10 days, I do not want to, personally, I do not want to, there is controversy, of course. Uh, I do not want to go for any uh, maneuver. If there is no neurovascular deficit or anything like that, well, after 3 weeks, uh, uh, nothing such is found even. So I let the uh, fracture unite or malunite. And if I had to do anything, you all know that uh, the tubitus virus is more common because there is medial combination. And uh, sometimes we have tubitus vulgus also. So I let it unite or malunite and tell them the if needed, we'll do later. But if it is uh, too much of displacement, too much of uh, the uh, the fracture fragments are apart. Sometimes I go for a reduction, and that is open. After two weeks, it has to be open. Okay. So uh, and the, yeah. Yes. Yes. Sir, the, the last question is: Which all are the views and the under the CM to confirm the correct alignment of fracture after pinning? Which all are the views? So what I do, I do not rotate the arm or forearm for seeing the. Uh, CM view. I take the forearm in a hand table or a board and do the AP as we, all we do in AP view and rotate the CM, not the for, not the arm or the forearm, uh, so that my reduction is lost. So I rotate the forearm to see the lateral view. So I, I usually see the AP and lateral view rotating the uh, CM. Okay, sir. Yeah, so last... that is that's a that's a way as a technique uh, by Sandeep Patwar then uh, that he is putting this uh, uh, the wooden wooden board and fix with a micro pole and then they turn the CR. But most of the stable fractures you can uh, do without CR also. I mean you can turn the extremity, but it's a good practice to move the CR and. Um, uh, fix the arm. Okay, don't move the arm. How to pin medial oblique fractures? Server. So, pinning medial uh, oblique fractures, uh, we have to see again in CM how much is the uh, how much is the uh, reduction, and we might have to uh, uh, might have to open a little more to uh, pin it medially. So, what's your say about this, Molly? Yeah, so medial oblique fractures uh, have a more medial segment distally, and there is minimal place on the lateral side. So, you may, you can put only one wire 
uh, from the lateral uh, pillar. And so you have to go for a medial pin. That's a, a situation where we do the, the indication of putting a medial pin is a medial oblique fracture, a rotationally unstable fracture, multidirectionally unstable fracture. So again, I also do the same thing. You put a small incision with an artery, you widen it. Uh, with a K-wire bender or a suction tip, I, I put it in uh, as a sleeve or sometimes I use a sleeve and make sure. I also ask my anesthetist to don't give relaxation to these children. And the moment uh, you drive your wire in, uh, you have a look at the little fingers. Uh, if it is switching, then you, you are either winding the sheath of the ulna or you are going through the ulna Then you have to retract it. At times, we may not use the power drill, but uh, just with the key handle gradually maneuver in. And where there is no twitching, then you can move ahead. And we all know that we have to keep elbow extended to keep this ulna now lying behind. Yeah. There is, Chinmay says, there is confusion many times by the lateral view. We get the elbow in internal rotation, external rotation. So, you are right that in external rotation, you will see that it is uh, nicely reduced. But in internal rotation, you, you may see that there is some rotational uh, element in reduction. What you need to do while doing internal rotation is, it's not just 90 degree, but you have to uh, internally rotate a little bit more to see the actual alignment of the proximal and distal segments. Uh, and in that we also, if it is rotated, then you come back, uh, you put a medial pin and while putting a medial pin, I would suggest to see uh, uh, the lateral view all the time because that in that view, uh, you should be able to see that reduction is 100%. Yeah, so sometimes it is uh, like that. If it's just minimal rotation, then you accept it. If it's too much, then you put a medial pin. Right. So I think that there's a time for case presentation. Dr. Sarwar can uh, guide you to that. Uh, it, if at all open reduction is required, yes. Open reduction. What is your approach of open reduction, Sarwar, if it is required? Posterior, anterior, anteromedial, anterolateral. Yeah. Lateral uh, usually in, in, in cases three to four weeks, I go for go with lateral. But if it is even older, I go with posterior approach. Uh, that I do not prefer to go usually because. So that's my, I I have a bit different approach here. If it is uh, if I'm not able to reduce one uh, by close means, I go from anterior uh, because I want to see the neurovascular structures right in front of me. And uh, depending where the spike is, if the proximal segment spike is medial, I'll go a little anteromedial. If it is lateral, then it would be anterolateral. And uh, Sheenam would show a case uh, where we required this uh, open reduction. But I, I prefer open in a fresh case. If it's a uh, late presenting, then might might go posterior. Yes, so sh shall we have the case, uh, doctor? I'll, uh, I'll stop share. Uh, please. Yeah. So we have doctor. Uh, doctor Bose from the Anirban. Bose. Yes, yes, yes. Doctor Bose, uh, you can uh, share your screen. Are you with us? Yes, sir. He's here. Yes. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Doctor Bose. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sharing my screen. Yeah. Thank you. Sir, I have I have shared my screen, sir. We are not able. Uh, we are not able to see that. Uh. 
I think from you your to... yeah, change my guide him, please. Yeah, yeah. I think you have to go into your Zoom app and you have to open the meeting and yeah, now you can. Okay. Now. Yeah. 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 Make it a presentation view. Yeah. So, sir, this is an interesting case of a pulsed supracondylar humerus factor in a six years old child. Moving forward, we have a uh, we had a six year old male child that have a history of fall on outstretched hand on uh, 9 5 2022 at around 7 pm on uh, by falling from a table. So he presented with presented to us with tenderness and swelling and deformity over the left elbow. And within two hours of trauma, he presented to emergency at around 19. Now with the local examination, we found that the left elbow is very tender. It was swelled up. There was ecchymosis present over the anterior aspect of the elbow, which is the brachialis sign, uh, as I said, brachialis sign or puffer sign. There was deformity that is visible, and uh, the capillary refill was not prompt, and the distal pulse was not palpable. The radial pulse was not palpable, even with the handheld Doppler. The extremity was very cold and pale, and uh, there was a pointing index sign also. So, these are the pre op imaging that we have done in our institution that showed that there is a displaced extension type supracondylar factor of the left side, a cartland type C or 4 might be. So what we did at emergency was that that pulse was not palpable by three finger method. So a handheld doctor was used, but still no radial pulse was audible. So a decision taken for emergency surgery plan was that uh, Close reduction and internal discussion or open reduction with the vascular exploration. And for temporary stabilization, a uh, upper elbow uh, slab was given in extension. Now, what were the intra of findings? The patient was supine under general anesthesia. A close reduction was attempted, but it was unsuccessful. We did an anterior approach to the distal humerus. We found that the back brachialis was uh, torn with proximal fragment button holding. That we can see in the uh, right hand picture that we did the anterior approach and uh, uh, the brachialis was torn. Now, moving forward, the median nerve and the brachial vessel found interferated between the factor ends. The brachial vessel isolated itself and protected. Partial chondral injury was noted over the anterior lateral aspect of the distal humerus. And fracture reduction was done by three KYs, two lateral and one medial. On the medial pin passed through separate incision after protecting the ulnar nerve. The median nerve decompression was done. The pulsation was a pulsation of brachial artery over the tented area returned gradually. Papaverin and worm saline with 2% lignocaine was sprayed over the vessel. We also uh, took the opinion of a CTBS surgeon and they said that no vessel injury was noted by them. So they said, uh, they said conservative management from their side. And after that, uh, on the table, the capillary return improved, the temperature of the extremity improved. Now, these are the uh, CM pictures. As you can see, we fixed the factor with uh, three K wires, two lateral and one medial. Now, in post op, we did a we uh, did a above elbow POP slab at 60 degree flexion because uh, uh, in the CM we can see that one pin was from uh, to the four quarter axis, so. Full flexion was not possible in this in this case. So a 60 degree flexion above elbow slab was given. Patient was kept in observation in ward for 48 hours. Pulse was still not palpable, but extremity became warm. The pink and cap uh, the extremity was became pink and capillary refill was prompt. 
SPO2 probe showed that there was there is waveform and 85 to 95% saturation of all the fingers. CTBI's opinion was asked, and they said that injection heparin to be started at 2000 international unit subcut sizing. Now it discharged the patient in stable condition. The extremity was warm, pink, and prompt capillary return was there, but no distal pulse was uh, yet palpable after 48 hours. So the above valve uh, POP slab was kept in C2. The wound was healthy. The dressing was done or, uh, at on uh, POD2, and the cavers are in C2. And CT as per the CTBS opinion, injection heparin was advised at, in the discharge summary at 2000 international unit subcut twice daily for the next 48 hours. And the relatives were explained about the ongoing treatment and the pros and cons about the treatment. Now, we did some literature, literature search and this was a uh, publication that showed that they, they showed three cases at which it was published in the Journal of American Automatic Society. They reviewed three cases, a case uh, a series. And case number one, they showed that an eight-year-old boy came with uh, a supra supracondylar fracture with a vascular insult with pink and warm extremity. In that patient, close reduction was done and a palpable radial pulse was noted after 24 hours of the trauma, after before the discharge. And in case two, a uh, six year old boy came with supracondylar humerus fracture with vascular insult. Close reduction and filling was done. Radial pulse was remain absent after the uh, surgery. The patient was observed for 48 hours. And at the time of discharge, the radial pulse was present by doctor examination, but was not palpable. So the patient was reviewed after four weeks and the strong, uh, the strong radial pulse was palpable after that. And in case number three, you can see that uh, a six year old girl came with a supracondylar fracture with muscular injury. Dose reduction was done, but immediate post of they, they found that a hand become pale and without radial pulse. The pins were then removed. A vascular surgeon opinion was done. Uh, they, they repaired the repaired a laceration of the brachial artery. And then open reduction was done, and then the palpable radial pulse was noted after 12 hours. So from this case report, we can say that the pulse may return after uh, it will take around, some cases it will take around 20, 12 hours, some cases it will take around 24 hours, and it, it, will might, it might take two to three weeks also in some cases. So the take home message is the key factors need to be considered for a decision making of a pulse placing pulse hand is the presence of a radial artery, Doppler signal, presence of good pulse oximeter waveform and oxygen saturation of greater than 95%, and number three is the intact median nerve function. If all the three criteria are met, recommendation is to observe the child closely for circulation and symptoms of compartment, and if all three are absent, then indication for arterial exploration is there. In our present case, the important two aspects are it is very rare occurrence of pulse supracondylar humerus that counts only 15 to 20 percent of all the factors of the, all the supracondylar factors. And number two is if we do a timely intervention of this kind of factors, it can give us some excellent results. Thank you. Well, thank you, Shown a beautiful case, beautiful case, and uh, as you said, uh, 15 to 20 percent. But we have to ready. We have to keep ready uh, ourselves for such a case. Was the vascular surgeon with you in the OT or not? Yes, sir. It was, uh, they were in the OT. Okay. Uh, after we did the uh, open reduction, we called the vascular surgeon to the uh, OT, okay. and they uh, they saw the case, and they they saw that. A uh, fracture was fixed, and they saw the brachial artery status, and they said that there was no injury um, they, they could see. So we can proceed for a conservative management from their side. Yes, thank you. We all all uh, should uh, keep in mind about the pink pulseless hand and white pulseless hand. 
as you have already mentioned here. So, uh, what I think the next lecture is probably with the complicated supracondylar cases, and I, I, I believe in uh, there it will be discussed. I think in the next lecture, uh, isn't it? Morin yes, has sir. gone probably. Yes, sir. the next uh, lecture we have we can we will cover that all the topics. I have one question for Dr. Bose. Uh, when you discharge the patient, how frequently you ask patient to visit to check for the pulses weekly or three daysly, or what will be the protocol for that? Sir, we said uh, to the parents that you check the pulse in every 48 hours and keep uh, calling us in our number that we, if, if you get the pulse or not. And uh, if you got the pulse, please notify us and review in the OPD after uh, whenever you get the pulse. That makes sense. Thank you so much. So Thank the you. next case will present by Dr. Shinam. Uh, Dr. Shinam, you are there? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, can you see my uh, screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. Uh, okay. My topic is uh, soft tissue interpositioning in supracondylar humerus textures. So what is soft tissue interpositioning? When proximal humeral metaphysis lacerates a brachialis muscle, it is known as soft tissue interpositioning. How should we uh, check the soft tissue interpositioning clinically? There will be no crepitus. There will be difficult close reduction and there will be persistent subcutaneous spike. You can see here a pucker sign. There is tanting of skin and there is a redness of the skin. How to reduce soft tissue interpositioning? There is a one paper on close reduction and percutaneous thinning of uh, humerus fractures with a brachialis sign positive. We should do, um, in this paper, it has been explained that uh, milk soft tissues of a proximal spike before applying traction. So you have to extricate the brachialis muscle in order to uh, reduce it. In this video, it has been well explained by Molin sir. That's how we do a uh, milking manual is done. Uh, we encounter in the last week two cases with soft tissue interpositioning. One needed close reduction and one needed open reduction. The six-year-old female came to us with pain and deformity of left elbow joint with history of fall on an outstretched hand. On examination, uh, there was no distal neurovascular deficit. We can see here, she can, uh, she can flex the index finger, she can flex the thumb, and ulna nerve is also uh, okay. Radiograph uh, showed this subcutaneous uh, spike. We can see lateral bone spike here, and uh, anterior humeral line is also far away from the capitalum. So this becomes the Wilkins modification of Gartland classification type 3. We needed uh, four cortices wire. Firstly, we uh, did milking maneuver and inserted the four cortices wire to engage the medial column and then later pillar wire was inserted. 
when it was uh, we when we were unable to reduce it by Vickelis uh, maneuver, we uh, we did the interior approach, and we also uh, inserted the medial pin. The next case was a five-year-old girl came to us with pain and deformity of right elbow joint. There was a history of fall from the slide. Contusion was present on anticubital fossa. You can see here. There is a paper which says soft tissue injury severity is associated with neurovascular injury in pediatric supracondylar humerus fractures. It was published in JPO 2016. This is the first paper who has discussed the soft tissue injury severity, which is uh, revealed the soft tissue injury severity with uh, as neurovascular injury association. In this patient, we also found that there was anterior introscious nerve involvement. We can see she is unable to flex the index finger. Radiograph revealed medial subcutaneous pipe. And uh, we can see anterior humeral line is far away from the capitalum. So this also makes the Wilkins modification of Gartland type 3. Then we uh, performed the Brachialis uh, milking maneuver. And uh, we successfully, we were able to extricate the Brachialis muscle. And we fix it via two lateral K wires. The summary is brachialis interpositioning can be suspected when there is anterior puckering or contusion. One should try brachialis milking maneuver before going for open reduction. Thank you. It was a lovely, lovely presentation, Shinam. So there is one question uh, by Dr. Proful that can you please elaborate on anterior approach? Yes, sir. Yes, anterior, uh, we prefer an uh, anterior approach and we make the plane between triceps and uh, brachialis. Uh, we make the plane between triceps and uh, brachialis. Uh, you're not, not able to hear you, Shino. We don't uh, use the uh, lateral, we don't use the posterior approach because there is a uh, Dr. Sarwar, your opinion, your take on these cases. Uh, so are you done, uh, Senam? Yeah, yes, sir. We may so, come in season over the interior aspect of elbow and uh, five centimeter above the flexion crease on the lateral side of the biceps. Okay. It ends on the medial order of the brachioradialis muscle. Okay, I, I, I do not uh, go for this anterior approach that much, so I can't tell you in detail, but this is what uh, it, it starts actually five centimeters above the elbow crease, and and as uh, Maureen said, I think that's the way if, if it uh, seems that there is some vascular involvement thinking or anything, so the incision cut uh, comes to uh, a little period. So I think Molin is not there. I we could hear from him. He's not there, isn't it? No, sir. Sir, he just left. Okay. Yeah. So this was a nice presentation, and right now we don't have any question. Uh, so doc, thank you, Doctor Sarah, for your lovely presentation.
thank you, you to everyone. dr and dr shinam for the lovely crisp presentation for anterior approach and close reduction and we will see you guys next week with uh, new presentations and new case discussion with our next uh, esteemed uh, professors in the field thank you thank you thank you everyone thank you so much thank you so much sir yeah